My name is Joe, I'm CEO of Arthur Leadership, and here on this program we talk about attitudes, behaviors, and tools that you as a small and medium-sized business owner can put into practice to double your productivity without spending any money at all. Real, concrete, practical things that make a difference that are easy for everyone to put into place. And today we have one more incredibly special guest, um, John Spence. Um, well, I was, John and I were talking before we, we came on, and I, I mentioned that one of the reasons I wanted him on, on the program is because his, his content is so great. You know, he, he's got wonderful, wonderful content, and it's absolutely aligned with what we've been talking about on the program for, for the last few weeks, the last few months. John, it's a real pleasure to have you. Welcome. Um, maybe just take the opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience and, and tell them a little bit about the work that you do. Thanks. Thanks, Georgia. I think the reason you liked the material you said is because it sounded like uh, I, you were, I was stealing it from you. So apparently we're very aligned. Uh, let's see. Started off uh, very young in business and was named CEO of one of the Rockefeller Foundations when I was 26, uh, overseeing projects in 20 countries around the world. Failed out of college before that. <laughs> and had to kind of remake it up. And since then, I've been the owner, CEO of five companies, uh, two of them multinational. And I small couple small companies and some larger companies and for the last 30 years or so i've been helping businesses around the world businesses and people to improve uh and and you and i talked about it to me it's the same fundamental thing i do work with apple and i do work with a brand new startup you know with three employees and it's the same fundamentals just more zeros exactly that's exactly and you know one of the reasons i, I love doing this program um is that we have a real global reach. I mean, I, I'm Scottish, I live in Brazil. Um, you're in the US and you, you have your global clients. So we have, we have this, you know, a real vision of what's going on in the world. And that's really where I want to start today. You know, we're in this time of incredible change that no one's ever lived through before. What are you seeing in terms of the business scenario? What, what, what does it look like for businesses in the world today? Uh, and this will be, I'm currently working very closely with companies in New Zealand, Australia, uh, Russia, Poland, UK, UK uh, Canada, Mexico. So it's a brain, obviously around the US. Here, a couple of things at the very beginning. Almost every business owner or business leader is stressed. Um, they, they have anxiety, stress, I would say a low level of depression. Uh, and that one of the big things that's coming up from a leadership standpoint is self-care. And to me, in the past, that sounded selfish, but I realize now under these challenging times, you gotta take a moment to back up and take care of yourself and your mental health and do those sort of things uh, to focus on it. And, and that dovetails nicely. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, he owns a very small company, three employees, and it happened to be an industry that was hit very hard by the pandemic. And this is a note I've had to share, a, a comment I've had to share with lots of entrepreneurs. It isn't your fault. Uh, there was no way you would have known this was coming. You had a great company. You worked hard on it. You had a great reputation, a fantastic brand. Your employees loved you. Your customers loved you. Then overnight, everything changed, and it created a lot of pressure. People like, I'm failing. I didn't do it. Now, this, is, this came out of nowhere a year ago. Not a single person we know could have told us what we'd be here in a year today. Yeah. And then the only other thing I'll add to that quickly is I see a lot of companies now looking at uh, may up to 70%, 80% of their employees don't want to come back full time. They want some sort of a hybrid approach. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I see the same thing. And so the, the next logical question is, you didn't see it coming. It's here. We're in the middle of the tsunami. Um, you've got, you know, 10, 15, 50 employees. What do you do? How, how do you move forward? How, you know, what, what, what's the starting point? What's, what's the first thing that they should do to try and figure out where do we go? Uh, first thing is to look at what's not working anymore and let go of it. Uh, you know, like you and I were saying, I traveled 200 plus days a year. It stopped for me. It stopped in one day. Yeah. I, boom, everything was over. So thinking about how to get to other places or doing 
it was, you know, it's uh, when I talk about the change process, this first step is an uh, irrefutable or irresistible case for change. So step one is it's not the way it was and it's likely not ever going to go back there. So don't hold your breath for that. Um, to me, then number two is getting really, really close to your customer and talking to them and finding how have their needs changed? What 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 new things do they need? What what things do they no longer need? Uh, it's it's really it comes down to I, have you heard the term, George, uh, AQ? No, that's your, you know, we've got IQ, your intelligence quotient, I'll call that competence, EQ, your emotional quotient, your ability to self-regulate and connect with the emotions of other people. AQ is your adaptability quotient. Other people call it your uh, agility quotient. Right. And that's your agility quotient. And that's all around resilience and what, what we would call um, optimist, uh, optimistic realism of saying, this is what we're faced with. This is what we're going to deal with. I'm going to be adaptable and agile and quick and nimble. And I think the only person that drives that is the marketplace, unless you're some sort of visionary and you see out a little bit further. But out further now seems to be about three months. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, my experience is it's the, it's the company that needs that. I mean, it's not all on the shoulders of, of the owner because it can't, the world's too complex. You know, that, this book of world that we, that we live in, um, you need everybody. You need absolutely everybody to be to be with those competencies and with that mindset. How do you how do you help you know business owners get rid of the, the fear of I'm, I'm losing control? And this it's an illusion of control anyway, as, as we all know. But how do you get them to to say, look, you just have to go with your people and you have to trust that that you've got good people and that they'll find a way through the storm. How do you help them navigate that? Uh, the Part of it, again, is the irrefutable case for changes. You have no choice. You're going to have to do this. You need to trust your people. Uh, also helping them understand that everybody knows they don't have the answers. They, you know, If you think you do, you're wrong. I was talking <laughs> to a group of MBA students the other day about, they said, what was one of the biggest challenges in my career? And I'm, George, I'm sure you've seen this with your clients and stuff. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. And I see a lot of leaders that don't want to show that they don't know. They think, you know, I'm a fraud. I made it here by late, by luck. I'm in over my head. I don't know how to fix my company, but I don't want anyone else to know that I don't know what I'm doing. Everybody knows that, you do, that you're making it up as you go along. So having that faith in your people. I think the other thing too is making sure, especially now when sometimes companies have had to get smaller, and this is incredibly important in a small company, is every single one of your employees has to be good. Uh, if you've got you know, you got a group of 10 and two are no good. You've just wiped, you know, wiped out 10% or 20% or of your entire workforce is mediocre. Yeah. You can't do that during these times. You've got to be on top of your game. Have you been seeing that too? Yeah, absolutely. And I also saw um, one of your videos, the, the, the three T's, which was great, you know, the train transfer or, or you know, terminate. And, you know, I, I think the first thing you have to realize is that you don't know your people. Right? You don't know yourself. None of us know. None of us knew how we would react in, in a worldwide pandemic until, you know, 12 months ago. Now, now we have an idea. So, so even though if you've worked with people for, for 5, 10, 15 years, right, you, you don't know everything that they're capable of. They don't know everything they're capable of. So assume good intentions, but also assume potential. Right? Assume that people are capable. It's, as long as you, you give them a vision that they buy into right, and give them give them some help and support, most people will find a way, in, in my experience. You know, I, and I, I think it's, it's easy to kind of fall into the trap of saying, well, I hired this person to do this job and this job now doesn't exist, so I'll get rid of this person. It's like, you're nuts. You know, the, the, the person's in your company, they've got tribal knowledge, they've got experience, they've got a vested interest, they, they like working in, in the organization, they like, the customer, they like something about it. Use that. You're not, you're not simply going to be able to transfer that in from, from the outside. But one, one of the things that I, I saw in one of your videos, which, you know, we'll come to the videos in a second, but one of the, the areas that, that you touched on, uh, which I thought was, was wonderful, was you, you talk a lot about the moment of truth, right? Which, which just really hit home for me in terms of, you know, pivoting your organization and knowing why you exist and what, what gives value. Talk a little bit about the importance of moments of truth. You know, it's funny, before we got on, George, I said there was one or two ideas I wanted to share that I thought would be super powerful. You nailed one. <laughs> you nailed it. So the moment's truth, and I'll do this fairly quickly. Um, 
was developed years ago by a name man, Jan, uh, man named Jan Carlson, who is the turnaround CEO for Scandinavian Air Systems. Came in there, they were literally on the verge of bankruptcy. And he looked at it and said, and, and so as, a, as an entrepreneur, think about this. He said, well, if we're gonna build this business, AKA rebuild this business, let's do it on the back of the very best customer. Let's pick the customer that's the most profitable, the easiest to deal with, blah, you know, and in the airline industry, that is a frequent traveler like me uh, that's on planes all the time. And, you know, I got a book at the last minute, pay whatever it costs. So he said, let's do that. Backed up, then he said, uh, and everybody that's listening, think about your own business. He backed up and said, then let's look at all the touch points. Every place we interact with our customer, it, with their example would be from, you know, when they see a billboard or they, you know, see a get, go to the website, all the steps through until I get home and uh, with my luggage. And then he said, now let's take a step back from that. Here's where it gets really important. It says, out of all those touch points, what are the three or four, maybe five moments of truth? The things that are make or break, the stuff you must do. And I, I always use the word, I'm sure you saw on the video, flawlessly. You've got to nail these things. Or, or, you know, the goal is to turn a customer into a customer evangelist. If you don't, if you miss one of these moments of truth, you turn them what I call a customer terrorist, where they go out and tell everybody about how bad you are. And the example I always use to teach this is restaurants. Basically, yeah. for every restaurant in the face of the earth, there are only four moments of truth. Good service good quality food, reasonable prices, clean. If you nail those four consistently well, you're flawless, people will give out, you know, will allow a lot of other, so the ambience isn't that hot, but man, the people are great, the food's incredible, the price is low, it's sparkling clean. The reverse is you could have a gorgeous, gorgeous restaurant, walk in, the bathroom's dirty, first thing they ask themselves, wonder what the kitchen looks like, I'm never coming back here. So the question is, and, and here was the other thing I wanna say, sit down with your team and talk about what are our moments of truth, the things that we have to do for our customer, but really the only person who knows it is your customer. So go ask your customers, what are the three or four things that we have to do to keep you happy? You know, why do you do business with us? And when they tell you that, they've just told you your unique selling proposition. They've basically given your mar marketing platform because I figure if a whole bunch of my really good customers tell me they're all doing business with me for the same four things, a lot of other good customers like that would likely do business with me for the same four things. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and what I love about this stuff is, you know, people confuse simple with, with easy, right? The stuff that we teach is simple, right? It's not easy because otherwise everyone would be doing it, but it's really simple. You want to know what your moments of truth are? Go ask your customer. Listen to them. And then the other thing that, that's linked to one of the things I, I saw in the video, which, which was beautiful as well, we keep talking about you need to nail the, these moments of truth flawlessly, but, but you isn't the business owner. You, you is the, the team, right? The people, right? It's, it, it's your people that are going to do this or not do this. And one of the questions that you ask, which is incredibly powerful, is do you treat your employees as valued customers? It's like, so if, if, you, if you treat your employees like dirt, or, or, or don't really care about them or don't help and support them, how can you then possibly ask them to treat the client well? It's like, you know, experience, it's like, you know, do what I do, you know, don't do what I, what I say, you know, you have to walk the talk. I mean, it, that, that seems so basic and yet people miss that. Well, yeah, I've got, I'm a, I've got a hundred zillion phrases I use all the time, but one of my most powerful ones that I love is, the customer's experience will never exceed the employee's experience. And the number one driver of happy, satisfied, loyal customers, customer evangelists, is happy, satisfied, loyal, and engaged employees. You're, you, exactly how you treat your employees is exactly how you're going to treat your customers. So as, like you said, as a leader, your most important customer is your team, and it's your job to deliver wow to them and take care of them. I'm not saying throw money at them. I'm just saying treat them with respect and dignity and give them the tools they need and love on them. And they will turn around and do the same thing to your customer. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, that means like, like you say, throwing money at them. I mean, I, I go back to my own experience. I, as soon as I came out of college, I started work for the actor, John Cleese, you know, Monty Python. and Oh, and I know that very well. Right. So I started working with him and a bunch of other um, you know, Mr. Bean and, you know, the guy who played House and all, the, all these actors, they had a company, um, Cleese had a company that did training videos. Um, and I worked there for 11 years. Um, they, they deliberately pay, paid less than the market, right? 
why? Because a couple of reasons. One, people wanted to work with clays and stuff like that. But two, it was in a phenomenal learning experience. It was like 100 plus employees. It was a smallish company. You got a chance to do absolutely everything. I mean, it was like four MBAs in one. So they paid like maybe 10% less than um, than the market. But you've got, you've got this experience that I'm, I'm, you know, till today I use this experience. So we were, we were delighted to, to make that choice, right? I mean, there were people who made the choice for a year. There were people who made the choice for five years. And people made the choice like me for 11 years, right? And until it, it got to its end of its natural cycle. But it, I think it's important for, for businesses to know that there are other reasons that people want to work with you, right? Not just... Well, I actually, I did a big research project on this. Uh, I went out to more than 10,000 high potential employees at top companies around the world, from small companies to Fortune 10, to the, the best of the best. And these are what I call voluntary employees. They're so good at what they do that if they didn't like where they're working, they just quit and get a job at the competition tomorrow. So th yeah. that means that they come to work every day in your company, not because they have to, but because they want to. So I asked them then, why do you work where you work? And you're going to love this. Six key things. Number one was fair pay. And fair was defined as 10% above or below, above or below what I would make to do the same job anyplace else. As long as you get roughly parity on pay, it goes out the window as a motivator even for the best employees. The next one was uh, challenging, meaningful work. I want to do something that's fun, exciting. I get to bring my whole self. I'm, a, I'm in, uh, it's, it's, I've got a purpose. Number three, this is going right down your story. And I didn't know you were going to talk about this. Number three is cool colleagues. I want A players only want to play with other A players. One of the biggest things that attracts top talent to any company, two person company, 20 person, 200,000 is I want to work with those cool people. Yeah. Those are fun. The next one was a winning culture uh, where, again, where it was enjoyable. We, we had a bond. We had a good tribe, a good culture. And then this last two hit directly. This is amazing that we're, we are fully aligned. The next one is personal and professional growth. Personal growth. I'm learning something every day. I'm getting two MBAs basically working here with all these amazing people. Uh, and I can look back at the end of the month and I'm smarter than I was at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and then professional growth says, do I see a place for myself in this company five or seven years from today? If you hire somebody really talented and they don't get to work with other talented people, they're not learning much and they don't see a place for themselves in the, or don't think, see themselves even in the company, they are gone immediately to your competition. Then number six, which was actually the single most important thing was I work for a, a leader I trust, respect and admire. Yeah, 88% of people that quit their job don't quit the job, don't quit the hours, don't quit the pay. They quit their idiot boss. So you and I are lockstep on that one, brother. So, so that was my experience, and then and then you know over the course of my career, my, my day job is you know I, I have a consulting company like you. We do business transformation projects. You know, so we compete with the big four, um, except we do it differently. Uh, um, but so I I did. 14 years with Johnson & Johnson doing their high potential programs in the supply chain, right? Um, compliance, regulatory, quality, right? The, the senior VPs, worldwide VPs, that, that top level. We did five years with NASDAQ. Um, so these are year-long programs, year-long uh, high potential development programs for you know the absolute top performers there that they're, they're grooming to the C-suite. Never, never in, in all of those programs, we've done over 50 of them, Never has anyone left to go to the competition. Never. Many, many times people have announced that they were approached to go and were staying exactly because they were in this program, because this program was so powerful and so transformational. And exactly what you were saying, there was a, I, might, I might leave like the minute I leave the, I leave the program, right? But there's no way in the world that I'm leaving when I'm in, because we, we, we use the actual learning methodology. So they're working on a real business project that's a tra you know, so we, we transformed um, NASDAQ's culture in, in four years. You know, we helped, we helped um, G and G over, over their, their transformation and business integrations, all that kind of stuff. So they're working on really cool, important projects. They're working with people they've never worked with before, right? They're working in with, with areas they've never worked with before. They're being challenged like they've never been challenged before. They're getting visibility that they've never had before. And these are the top performers. And these are the people who, who thought, all oh, right, you know, it's all it's all great. And, I'm, and all of a sudden they go into this program and it's like four levels above what, what they've experienced. And it's such a powerful learning experience that none of them would ever consider saying, 
I don't want this, right? I, I, let, let me leave it and, and go get 10% more somewhere else. I mean, there's proof, there's, there's empirical evidence that this is, this is the case. Yeah, and so let's, let's take it down to your listeners. I've only got four people on my team. How do I surround them with top talent and get them all these trained? Here we go. These things, uh, uh, videos, audios. Uh, you've been watching my videos, YouTube, uh, uh, audio books, everything else like that. Um, co- creating a learning culture. So if you can't afford to bring in some hot chat consultant or, or you know, go to a big training program, create a culture where you've got a book club. You're reading every month. You're doing so. I, I throw this statistic out all the time. The average business person reads a half a business book a year, 0.5. Uh, if you were to read or the equivalent thereof of one book every other month, six books a year, whether it's audiobooks, podcasts, blah, 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 the equivalent of one book every other month, you're in the top 1% in the country you live in. Yeah. If you read one book a month, not six, uh, the one every year, one book a month, 12 a year, you're in the top 1% on the face of the earth. The bar is very low. So yeah. you... The, some of the smartest people in the world put all their stuff into a book or a video and everything, and you can often get it for free. Well, uh, so that's, so there's that's no excuse that's, not to do that. Yeah, that's the segue I wanted to make because I did say we'd come back and talk about um, the, the, the videos. So people get people don't understand this, this thing about a learning culture, right? They, they think that, oh, I need to send people on a course or they need to do a, a postgrad or an MBA. Those models are, they need the, the, you know, so I, I went to your site, and num- number one, right? Uh, not your site, the, the, well, I went to the site, but I also went to the, the YouTube channel. Every single person on the planet who is in business, whether you own the business or not, should be visiting your YouTube channel every day, right? Honestly, I mean, it's, what, so what, what, what John's got there is he's got a whole series of videos that are between one minute and five minutes, right? That just give you a really complex, uh, situation, a really complex idea, and simplify it and make it practical. Right? If you if you can't spend one minute or three minutes a day learning a new concept, you're not going to survive in business, right? Your business isn't going to survive. You're not going to survive in business. But you don't need any more than that. I mean, it, literally, you know, I, I could go I could go and watch a video a day for the next 365 days. It would take me between one and three minutes every single day, and I would learn stuff that would transform my productivity, transform my life, transform the, the team. You know, so I think people have a misconception about what you know learning is and, and a learning organization and all that kind of stuff. It's simple stuff. It's simple stuff. And I, I would encourage like you said, this stuff's all free. I mean, all my stuff's free. All my stuff's on the internet's free. All your stuff's on the internet's free. There are other people who do great stuff. There's absolutely no excuse anymore. But you do need to get into the habit of doing something or watching this stuff and then doing something with it, right? I always say to people, the only two things I can't do for you, right? I, I can provide this stuff for free. And I, it, it's all my 25 years of experience and I, I'll give it all free, you know, with an open heart, no problem. Two things I can't do for you. I can't watch it for you and I can't put it into practice for you, right? I'll, I can help you put it into practice. That, that's fine. But I can, those, those two things are yours, right? But if you do those two things, the results are immediate. I mean, you, you must see that with, with your customers. I mean, the, the results are immediate when they watch this stuff. The, well, you know, I do a lot of executive coaching, as I'm sure you do, and I do it in a completely different way. I'm more of a what I call a business acumen coach, and the way I do it is I assign reading. I'll send someone two articles or three articles on strategy, 20 pages, maybe a, a, two videos to watch, and then we go down through it for a couple hours and, you know, over, we have, over a course of weeks, and I just get it until they teach it back to me. But I have so many of them and I, they'll call them and they're not my articles. They're a Harvard article or Wharton or something like that. I had one the other day because this has changed, totally changed the way I'm to look at my company. Completely, I, this thing right here is my new uh, structure for how I'm going to bring in talent. Thank you so much. And I'm thinking it was a six page article. You know, imagine if you did that, you know, and we'll use your, if you did 15 minutes of study a day over three years, you would be absolutely in top 1% of business learners in the world. It's all it takes. <laughs> and it costs nothing, nothing. And then, and then imagine you did that with everyone in your team. There you right? go. And then every now and again, you know, like once a week, you do, you do a, you know, a brown bag lunch or you know, a Zoom lunch these days. And, and you say, what, what did you learn that was interesting? What did you learn that we might be able to apply? Right. 
you, you literally will transform your business every time you do it. It's not, it's not like a one-time transformation. I mean, when I talk about doubling your productivity, right? Every time you do this stuff, you'll double the productivity. So you start with two, you go to four, you go to eight, you go to 16, you go to 32. And it never stops because your, your, your current team are capable of 64 times the productivity that, that they're doing at the moment, right? And, and it's these little things that, that will help that happen. Um, you know, you're, all you're doing is setting the context and letting people go run with it. Yeah, and your good people, let me say, the good people will become addicted to it. They'll be yeah. sending each other links and passing each other stuff. And, hey, let's talk about this video at lunch. And I saw this thing. It doesn't apply to the part of the business I work in, but I think it will apply perfect to you. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's again, we for your listeners, if you have two people on your team or 20, this can be, you know, moments of truth. This is another thing. Make it a learning organization where everybody's helping and sharing information and talking about the customer and having fun. And you'll look up and it immediately will have impact. A year you'll look back and go, I can't, we're not even the same company. Yeah. And, and I tell you what's interesting. I hear this, this comment a lot. Um, again, it goes back to that old mentality of people command the control and the illusion of control. And, you know, people say to me, business owners say to me, yeah, but they'll, they'll, they'll go research stuff that, that isn't relevant. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you have no idea what's relevant to your, your company in this new world, right? You, you have no idea. You have no idea how blockchain is going um, is, is to impact the, your, your um, legal firm, um, you know, or, or, or your, your, your restaurant, right? Um, you know, or how very price, I, mean, I, I was working at NASDAQ. I was working with NASDAQ and, you know, so they do all that, you know, variable pricing, all, all that kind of stuff. And they were, this was like three years ago. They were, they were talking to me about um, how very, very soon everything is going to be based on these algorithms. Mm -hmm. like, why, should, why should your pizza cost the same at 8 o'clock on a Friday night as it does at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday? Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. It makes no sense for you. It makes no sense for, for the restaurant, right? Um, you know, in the same way as, as you get an Uber, right? If you're, if you're at JFK, at, you know, 5 p.m. on a Friday night, you know, God save you, right? But, you know, it's going to cost you more than, than it's going to cost, like, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning on, on a Wednesday. It's like, so everything is going to come to this. Like, cars, right? They're, they're going to start selling cars with, with these, uh, you know, using these algorithms and that sort of thing. So things that, my, my point is, things that people think are not relevant are probably the most relevant because that's what's going to get you ahead of the competition. That's what's going to give you an edge. Right, so so you've got you've got a, a hairdressing company. So try and figure out what the what the mechanics are doing, right? Try to figure out what the restaurants are doing because if you can bring that into your business, you're going to be ahead of all the competition. You, none of us know what's relevant right now. now. I mean, the world has been turned upside down four times, right? And it's all completely new. So let them study whatever it is that they want, and then at some point, I mean, you you, you probably know this. The um, design thinking you know the double diamond thing on, on, on design thinking so you know f at, at the beginning what you want is people to open up their mind right and, and and be divergent in their thinking and then will be convergent and then you go divergent again and convergent right so let them be divergent let them let them figure out the, study whatever they want whatever whatever they think might be relevant and then at some point in the future try and figure out what does this mean to us it's interesting in the companies, different companies I've run, I've always given everybody a, a, mi a minimum of $1,000 a year to spend on education, whatever they wanted. I don't care if you want to go to learn how to, you know, paint or throw clay or what, you know, play the drums, or if you want to go study strategy or whatever, but I just want you to invest in yourself to learn something, buy books, go to a class, doesn't matter to me. And one of the ways I looked at it as an owner slash leader of the company is if you didn't spend your 1000 bucks there, we have a serious problem because if, if I, if, if you go a whole year, and you can't spend a thousand bucks on learning for yourself. It's really probably not a priority for you. And if it's not a priority for you, you are might no longer be a priority for my company. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about, about leadership. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I find it weird, you know, the stuff that you and I have been teaching for years and years and years is now suddenly become, you know, oh, people are going, oh, yeah, that, that's right. That's how we have to be. It's like, yeah, we've been telling you that for a long, 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 long time, but I'm glad you, I'm glad you've caught up. So what, what, what does a leader look like today? What, what, what do you need to be a, a, a successful leader? 
Well, there's two steps to this, in my opinion. And first of all, you know, leadership at it, at its sort of biggest thing is a theory. You know, mm -hmm. it's different for every organization. It's different for every person. So I can't put a mold on it. You can't. I can give people some frameworks and say, these are the things that I see. Uh, so when I look at, you know, my experience, we're getting hundreds of companies doing a ton of research, wrote a book on leadership. There are some fundamental things around character, honesty, integrity. Uh, got to be a great communicator, uh, especially in and being great communicator doesn't mean talking. It means asking questions and listening. Uh, got to be a great getting along with other people, high EQ. Um, and that's even more important now. We figured out that because I did a TED talk on the, the future of leadership and I talked about those three questions, IQ, EQ, AQ. And your EQ, if, if you're competent, but you can't get along with people, you can't be an effective leader. So you've got to be good at what you do, but you've got to be able to really get along with people. Collaboration, I just put up there. You've got to be courageous. And the key thing that I would say around courageous is vulnerability, um, is admitting you don't have all the answers and that you need help. Uh, I think another big thing right now is it, it, you would look at around vulnerability, humility, but a, a, a big thing I think that leaders need to do right now, especially during the pandemic, is help create psychological safety for their folks that things are changing, they're changing fast, we're gonna have to change fast, we're gonna make mistakes. You know, if somebody makes a mistake, don't, and goes up way out on a limb, don't saw the limb out, run out, give them a big hug and say, I'm not happy that we messed this up, but I am so happy you told me about it, and I'm so happy you took the risk. So, because as soon as somebody does something and gets slammed for it, you will have no more innovation, no more creativity. So and a, another big challenge, and you've probably seen this too, George, I saw this during the recession, the Great Recession, is the lack of courageous communication. People are scared to lose their job. They're scared about the future of the company. They're worried about this, but they won't say anything. And the only thing that's gonna save your company if you're struggling is getting together with your people, working together, talking to your customers and having those courageous uh, conversations. And that all comes down to making it a safe place to talk. Yeah. And yeah. It I, I saw that video that, that you did talking about, you know, having, having the courage to have those conversations. And it, it amazes me. I mean, I speak to senior, senior leaders. And, you know, they, all the time they're complaining about lack of resources, lack of bandwidth. And, so, and, and you know, they, they keep getting things dumped on their plate. And it's like, well, okay, let's take it one step at a time. Why do you accept those things? Nobody, nobody can dump something on your plate. You're, you're worldwide vice president. Nobody can dump stuff on your plate. You, you, you accept, and a lot of it is, you know, their own personal drive. I've never, I've never failed in my life. I've always been the go-to guy or girl, and and all that. It's like their own mentality. But also, they're terrified of saying to their, their, their boss, "I can't do this. I can do these ten things, but these other twelve that you want can't be done." with the resources that I've got. So work with me to get new resources. I mean, a, a very basic conversation, very, very basic. And they're like terrified. And it, you know, it, it goes back to kind of what you were saying about the humility, but also the honesty of, of people don't think that you know everything. And people, be, people actually think you're an idiot if you try and pretend that you know everything. So okay. be vulnerable and saying, saying what you don't know doesn't take away from what you do know. Right, you know, say I don't know this, um, but I do know this, and so let's figure out what you know and what I know and what we can put together to get to get to an answer. If you model that behavior, you 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 create that atmosphere that that you need in people, and it, and you know, it's as simple as that, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's it is as simple as that. Hey, I was thinking, I have a good, I have a question for you because I've been seeing this a lot. I, I've seen it my whole career, but I've been seeing a lot lately. Is when someone leaves the organization. Uh, and even a senior level person is asked to, to, you know, go someplace else and find their career or whatever. As soon as they leave, everybody starts complaining about it. Oh, Bob did this wrong. She, you know, Sheila never turned her work in. It was, it was, a, it was horrible. Blah. And I'm thinking, why didn't anybody say that while they were there? And again, it's that, it's that safety thing. And, and I, when I'm coaching people, they'll say, well, this happened to Bob. Blah, blah. And I go, did you say that to him? Did you tell her that? Did the words actually come? Well, I didn't actually say it, but like that it doesn't exist. You know, well, there's another piece to it there. There's another piece, which is some people are scared that 
Well, if I say that, then someone will say to me what I'm not doing. It's like, yes, and that's a good thing. <laughs> if you don't know about it. You know, if, if I don't know the information, it's like doing a, a multi-rated feedback. You know, people people die a death. And, oh, oh, my God, people, what are people going to say? It's like, look, they're already saying it or they're already thinking about it. If you at least know what they're saying or thinking, you have a chance to do something about it. If not, you'll wonder one, one day why you're in the parking lot with a, with a brown box and, and, a, and a couple of, you know, photographs, right? So you, you need to know. But also, I mean, there's another piece to it as well. I mean, it's really simple stuff that it cracks me up, right? When we're working with teams, we go, we go into a team and we say, what are your ground rules? Well, we kind of, it's like baseball's unwritten rules, right? <laughs> Everyone knows what they are, but nobody knows what they are. Everyone wonders why they keep getting balls thrown at their head, right? It's like, let's write them down. Let's agree on them. Let's see exactly what they are. How do we communicate? How do we make decisions? How do we hold each other responsible? What do we do when someone doesn't live up to their responsibility? Let's have that go. It takes 30 minutes, right? And once we've got it, that's it. That's it. We've, we've got it. We can, we can. And what happens is people hold themselves accountable because, you know, it's there. It's there. And we all signed up for it. You know, we, we, we explicitly, it was an opt-in, right? We explicitly said, yes, I, I'm willing to go along with these rules. So now we can go off and, and do our thing. Because we, you know, number one, I'm not going to let the team down because I signed up to the rules. But if I happen to do that, it's easy for the team to come to me and say, George, remember we said that one thing we would always do is hand stuff in on, on the time that we agreed. You're not doing that. that. So instead of John, you know, oh, John hates me. That's why John's having this conversation. It's oh, John's just calling attention to what we all agreed with. So it's just an easier solve. Yeah. What are the things that when I work with teams like that and accountability, I, I say as much as possible, let's make the goals and the expectations binary. It's one or zero, black or white, yes or no, no guessing. Um, here's another, I got a gazillion of these phrases. Here's another one. Ambiguity breeds mediocrity. Yeah. And if you sit down as a team or as a manager, you know, an employee and say, here's exactly what success looks like. Here's how we're going to measure it. This is the date it's due. Uh, this is the budget you have. Here's the decision-making authority. We get it super clear, incredibly clear expectations, and they're binary. That way, if, like you said, George, if something's wrong, I said, George, I love you, man. We worked together for years. However, you agreed to sell $3 million this quarter, and you only sold 2.8. There's no, you know, there's no I feel or an opinion or I think. You either did it or you didn't. That takes the emotion and the politics and the, all that out of it and just says, uh, you're okay, your performance wasn't okay. We're still friends, but you need to find another $200,000, George. You're short on your, your quota. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing with, you know, with the team dynamics. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, John's not pulling his weight. And it was like, okay, so go have a conversation with John about what, what his weight is and what he should be pulling, right? Well, I can't do that. So why not? The team needs the team needs John's contribution. John's not giving his contribution. Now, my suggestion is always to go and find out. Hey, John, I know you're great at contributing. Um, you, you, we also see that you're not able to contribute, you know, as you normally contribute in this team at the moment. What's going on? How can I help you? Exactly. Exactly. I want to help you because there's no point in me saying let's get rid of John because we need John's contribution. So I need to figure out, you know, how, how I what I can do to help John. So that he can give the contribution so that I win. Yeah, I'm just saying, if he fails and I fail, the company fails. And this is not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a, a sort of connected point, but I wanted to make it because I think sometimes leaders don't understand this. That, you know, when I did it when I was running companies, I do it when I have my clients. You walk through and everybody puts their head down. They're like, oh, my God. It's, you know, it's like uh, from Monty Python. <laughs> Virtual, <laughs> it's, you know. And I, you know, like I used to think I'm a nice guy. I don't yell or scream. I never lose my temper. Why are people afraid of me? And then I realized one day I have all the power. I can just terminate them if I want to. So I have all the I have their full economic future in my hands if I chose to abuse it. Uh, and it, so the point I make here is you have to realize as a leader, people are always going to be nervous around you. And here's the big part. You live under a microscope uh -huh. because of that. They're watching everything you do. They're watching what you don't do. They're listening to what you say. They hear what you don't say, and they make up a story about it. And sometimes it's not a good story. So the key is, is you got to realize that you really are under a microscope. They're they're afraid of you at some level, uh, and they they literally 
call it leadership, they take your lead and act and behave the way you do. So if you're not willing to have those conversations, your people are not going to have those conversations. If you don't treat them great, they won't treat the customer great. We just did a nice loop all the way back to the beginning. And I'll tell you what's interesting with that is you probably see the same thing when you go in as a consultant. You know, we, we certainly do. that. When we go in and, and we're running these high potential programs at these senior leaders, we set a tone, right? We set a tone that, hey, we're here to do work, right? To do great work. And you're capable of doing great work. We're going to have a ton of fun because that's who we are. We're going to learn a lot. Um, we're going to be open and transparent. We're going to have conversations. My success is 100% dependent on yours, right? If, if you're not successful, I'm not successful. So we set all those ground rules. And then we give them all the best practices, right? How, how to have a good conversation, how to set ground rules, how, you know, how to make sure you're all going in the same direction, some decision-making tools and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, we, we prove that we're not perfect. And we always say, you know, giving and receiving feedback. You know, I'll give you feedback. I, I will give you feedback. I will give anyone feedback at any point, anywhere. And I have done throughout my whole life. I will also accept feedback from anyone at any point, right? And, and I will model that. So tell it. So we, we'll do stuff like plus the elders or whatever, you know, so it's continuous improvement. So, and people see it working and they'll see that I'm not perfect, but they'll also see that we're willing to always course correct and, 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 and change and whatever. But we set a really high bar, a really yeah. high bar um, for ourselves and, and for them because we want really high results, right? We want, we want the results to be at the height of, of these people as well. And I think as a leader, you can people forget that as a leader. You know, going, going back to that power that you have. Yeah, you have the power and it can instill fear, but at, at, at its root, it's just power. So what do you do with it? Well, create an environment of, of high performance, right? Create an, an environment of, of love and acceptance and, and inclusion and diversity and create all of those good things. Create an environment of communication, right? And then just watch people explode in terms of productivity. It, years ago, somebody came to see one of the companies I was running. And we were doing really well at the time. The team was gelling, customers, I mean, it literally was on track. And the guy looks and goes, it looks like you're running a cult here. And I went, I am. It's a cult of excellence. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> it's like, you know, another point I make, realize is the employee's bar can never be higher than the leader's bar. Leader can't be down here and expect this from their people. So it, it's always got to be a little bit higher to hold yourself. That's why leadership is so fun, in my opinion, is it forces you to be better than who you actually are. Yeah. You don't have the ability to blow your, you know, blow your stack, yell, scream, pound the desk, tell people what to do. Um, that's not a leader. That's a tyrant. And yeah. so if you want to lead a company, well, you got to do it. We got to have fun. We got to pursue excellence. I have to deliver excellence. We got to treat each other with respect and dignity and love and really take great care of our customers and have fun doing it. And if you do that, then work become, becomes not work. It becomes joyful with people you know that you enjoy doing work you care about with uh, a leader you trust, respect, and admire. And again, none of this costs any money. This is all what I would call ad, attitudinal behavior. How, how do you think? How do you act? I, I agree completely that one, one nuance I'd put in that, which is a really interesting conversation I have with the majority of my coaches, the majority of my coaches are go-getting, alpha, you know, senior vice president, blah, 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 blah. Really, really good at what they do, right? That's why they're, they're in the job. And their biggest challenge, most of them, their biggest challenge is holding people to their expectation, expecting people to deliver what they're capable of delivering. Right. You know, and I keep saying to them, look, your job is not to demand that your people are as competent as you. Your job is to get the most from your people, whatever it is that they're capable of giving you. If they're capable of giving you that, then you have to get that from them. There's no point in complaining that they can't give you that. And, and yeah, you're in you're in your position because you've never met a challenge that you couldn't embrace, that you're the smartest, you work the hardest, you're this, you're that. You cannot demand that from your people because you know what? At some point, they're going to turn around and say, "I'm not capable of that," and check out. You know, whether they do it, you know, actively or whether they do it passively, they'll check out. So, and it's a difficult one for for real go getters and real high potentials and real hard drivers. It's a difficult one to say, "Look, I'm not saying for you to accept mediocrity, not at all, never, never." But you can only demand what the person's capable of giving you. 
And once that penny drops, then everything changes. And one thing to add to that, because I, I know a lot of the people that listen to your show are entrepreneurs, small to medium sized businesses. Don't expect your employees to live at your business like you do. No. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I've got a couple of people I work with. They're the proudest that they're number one in and last out. And if someone gets there at six, they'll be there at five 30 the next morning. If the guy shows up at five 30, they're going to be there at five. They've got to be in first out last work on the weekends, everything. This is not a badge of, of honor to, to be the one who works the hardest. And two things happen. Number one is you get pissed off because you expect your employees to work the way you do. It's not their company. It's not their baby. Uh, and then number two, you start to drive them in the ground, as you said, because they go, I'm watching him. And no matter how early I get here, he's here earlier. And I'm afraid to leave until he's done. So yeah. I'm working six in the morning until eight at night, because if I don't, I won't be living up to the standards of my boss and my life sucks, but I still have my job. And, and so that's another interesting pivot. To, so let's talk about one of the dangers. Of, I mean, you and I work, work virtually. We've all, you know, we've worked virtually for, for years because, you know, we have global clients. And, you know, the whole world suddenly discovered that they had to learn how to do that a year ago. And one of the big challenges, of course, is that people don't know how to organize themselves, right? You know, if, if you go to the office, it's like, okay, I can to some extent leave behind my life and go to the office and I'm working there from nine to five or whatever it happens to be. And then I go home and I can deal with home stuff. When people are working at home, you know, the, the three kids running around, you know, they've got a sick mother, um, they're, they're, they're trying to work out, you know, Amazon are trying to deliver stuff at the door and there's construction going on next door. And, and maybe they don't have a, an office, you know, in, in that. And, and the boss is seemingly online 20, 25 hours a day. Right. And, and people are burning out. People are talk about the importance of how, how do you help guide people through sorting out their life and, and figuring out how they can take care of their life and their work demands and, and that sort of stuff. How, how do you help teams work through that? Well, it's very, very hard right now, because, as you said, we're all learning. So a couple of things that I, I tell people is. It doesn't work the way it used to. This is a completely different work environment. Don't hold yourself to the standard of eight to five in the office, one hour for lunch. That doesn't exist anymore. You're going to have to find a way to build this around checking on your kids, checking on your your mom, you know, your sick uh, mom or dad, picking up the thing. You're also going to have to make it to the meetings. You're going to have to do your work, but you might be doing your work at different times. Um, I know a lot of people now that they're the, what they would quote unquote the work they'd be doing during the day. They come home, they have dinner. When they put their kids to bed, they work till 10 at night or 11 at night, then get up and do this stuff. Um, my hours have shifted dramatically. I'm used to, when I'm on the road, getting up at five or six, having breakfast with a client, working all day. I get up at nine now. I read for an hour, hour and a half. I come to my office and I work till seven or eight, and I might do a little bit of work at home. Uh, so you're going to have to find the blend that works for you, but you have to get the work done. Yeah. And I think the, the other element of that is what I, boundaries. Is just yeah. saying, this is home time. This is work time. If I have a meeting here, I'm going to give it 100% of my attention and that's it. But th then at 6 p.m. or whatever it might be or time to get dinner for my family, I'm stopping it there and nothing short of a true emergency is going to block out those boundaries. Because without boundaries, it all just weaves together and work yeah. will almost always win, yeah. uh, which creates anxiety, stress. Uh, depression and all those things and tension in your family when that when it becomes too blurred and it's not it's well I saw one the other day do we do we work from home or live at work <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly and and I think that that that's part of I mean I remember when I when when J and J when Johnson and Johnson were 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 going from this you know 64 different companies and in, into becoming one enterprise and all of a sudden, they, they started to give people worldwide roles. Um, they, they, they fell into that trap of, you know, I have to be first in the office and, and last to leave because I'm the leader. And then it was pointed out to them that they, their team spans all 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you physically can't be, right? And also, if, if you're one of these leaders who's, you know, fire off a text and you demand an answer, it could be 3 o'clock in the morning in Hong Kong and, and – this poor person isn't going to wake up, shouldn't be waking up to, to reply to your text. So we have to teach them how to, how to do it differently. And one of the, I remember one of the great lessons, um, the woman who was head of quality at Johnson & Johnson is now head of supply chain. Her name's Kathy Wenger. She's one of the greatest leaders I've, I've ever had the privilege of working with. She's a, 
She's absolutely incredible. And I could talk for hours about how great she was. But one of, one of the things that she talked about was, you know, you don't, number one, you don't have to be in the office because you're on planes all the time. You could be in any time zone, right? Number two, if you decide at 10 o'clock you need to go and pick up a, you know, a child from school or, or you, you need to go to, to do whatever, go do it. Because I know that you're working at 11 at night and I know you're working at two. I need you to deliver what you need to deliver. I do not need you to be physically present, right? In during some predetermined work hours. And I think, I think when we're working virtually as a leader, you need to encourage that in your people, right? Yeah. Tell us, tell us when you're not available. Tell us, if, you know, I'm, I'm out from, from 10 to 11, but don't then turn around to, to say to people, where the hell were you this morning? It's like, it doesn't matter as long as they're delivering what they need to deliver. It's hilarious. Years, this is a way ahead of its time. I'm not saying I'm a visionary, but I left, I joined the Rockefeller Foundation in 1989, uh, right out of college. And I took over as CEO in 92, I think. 93 laptops had just been invented and, you know, we're just starting to use computers. And except for the people, the re receptionists and stuff, uh, I told everybody, my whole team, I don't care if I ever see you. All I know is I want your work to be on my desk when it's due and I want it to be world class. Other than if you want to come and do the work here, that's great. Want to, if you want to surf, I had a young lady work for me, was a national surfing champion. But you want to surf all day, get Chinese food, come and sit with your husband at night and get the work done. As long as it's in on time and world class, I have no problem. My board of directors, who were all men in their 50s all the way back then, said, no, 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 can't do that. Now, but I go, we're, be we're better than we've ever been in the history of the company. No, no, no. So they must have a time clock. So I had one of, one of the, the uh, receptionists clock the entire company in at nine. Chick, 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 and every night clock the entire company out at five. And he looked at it, he goes, You're, everyone clocks in within two minutes. I go, they're very disciplined. You ought to say, they all show up in line in the morning. And he looked at me, he's like, are you sure? I go, oh yeah, they're all. <laughs> Really got, look at the great results that they're generating. Oh, we quadrupled the size of the company. And if he would yeah. stop in, there'd be one person there. Likely not me. <laughs> so. And you know, there's another piece to that as well, which is one of, one of my biggest bugbears is, you know, com companies, most companies, they think that they, the work has to be done in the meeting, right? And meetings are just not the place to do work. Right, but you don't get stuff done in meetings, right? Especially when you've got 10, 15 people in a, the majority of meetings, right? I mean, I get called in as a facilitator, right? I, I can make good money as a facilitator because it's that difficult to, to run a, a really, really good meeting, right? So I, I keep saying to people on project, and we're doing the global projects or you know whatever the project happens to be, I say, look, do not try and get the work done in the meeting. A one hour meeting once a week is not gonna get your project delivered. The, the point of the meeting is to figure out who's gonna do what between now and the next meeting, right? And then people can go off and do it whenever the heck they want, right? And, and if we have to make a decision, we make a decision. If we have to get aligned, we get aligned. If we have to air some dirty laundry, we can air some dirty laundry. That's why we get together. But we don't get together to do the work because it's completely ineffective. You must see that. I look at on that is, and we don't use meetings as a report out of what we did last week. Oh, so because I see a lot of meetings wasted. Small companies, big companies have. How's everything going in your department, John? Well, ten days ago we talked to this customer. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to assume that everything's going great, unless there's a problem. You, you'll bring that in the meeting. Otherwise, telling me all the things that went great is a waste of time. All we need to talk about is what help do I need going forward. Um, have you, uh, George, seen the, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Alan Mulally, the, the former CEO at Boeing and then uh, at Ford. Great book about him, uh, American Icon, fun book. Yeah. But he ran that whole company on uh, an easy dashboard of green, yellow, red. Green, you're doing great. Yellow, you need help. Red, you're, you're not doing it. If you can run a $100 billion or $90 billion company on a simple three-point spreadsheet with open conversations, and making sure, and he always said, I don't want any reports in the meeting. I want to talk about what we're going to do together to get to the next stage. If you want to send me a memo about how great your team is, I'd love to hear it. And I'm happy, but that's not what the meeting's for. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the meeting, the meeting is there to, to figure out what we've learned that nobody knows. Right. Yep. 
it's to solve problems that have come up. I mean, it's, I always say to, to teams as well, is assume that things are going well until people tell you that they're not. And then, of course, you have to create the culture. You have to tell me if you're, if you're not going to hit a deadline or if, if you've hit an obstacle that I can help you with. If not, you don't need to tell me anything because I assume that you're doing great work because you're great people because exactly. I've heard you, right? So <laughs> I know you're great, right? So, you know, let, let's figure out how we can use the, the time together, you know, to be productive and to add value. I mean, it, it amazes me that, you know, this confusion of activity and productivity, right? Everybody does stuff and people don't measure, what, yeah, but what did it achieve? Are, are we further forward now than we were? You know, and once you get people in that mindset, um, mind, mindset shift, right, of figuring out what is it that we're trying to achieve and are we closer to achieving it, then the productivity goes through the roof. The, the stuff that's just activity, just, just stop it, stop doing it. Yeah. Well, the easiest one to put down on is sales. If your sales quota is a million dollars, I don't care if you do it in two calls or 2,000. The only thing that matters is did you hit the quota? Uh, and if someone can walk in and do it in a couple of days, I, I had a young man I worked with years ago, a minute him. He was a site acquisition manager for Taco Bell restaurants. And he had a, he was only allowed to, to do so many, uh, sites a year. He was a, an out, uh, contractor and like 12 a year. And they had, and they, there was a list of criteria and every one of the things you checked was more money for him as a contractor to find it. He would get in his car and live in his car basically for two months and get all 12 sites and everything on the checklist, everything, the highest thing you get, he turned all 12 in, he, they, they, by, by contract, he couldn't do any more. And he would take the other 10 months off and go play and do other stuff and side jobs. Or he was trying to teach himself Russia. So he'd go to Russia for a month to hang out there. And I thought he was the best example of, I know what's due. I know what absolute world class is. I, this is exactly what's done. I'm going to get it all done with a tremendous efficiency. And then I'm not going to, because other people would be, you know, it would take them the whole year and they'd be trying to get the last three in the last month. He's a, he's on the beach somewhere <laughs> and enjoying his bonus. And, that, and that's a, that's a bigger conversation. We'll have to come back to this in another time, because the, I think it's, it's incredible to me that how, how do companies reward top performers? They give them more work. Oh yeah, yeah. They don't say thank you or, or that's great or you know what. So so what we do is we, we kill the golden the golden goose because it's like we, we overburden them. It's like I mean I, I remember this when you know I was I used to work for a, a global consultancy and and we you know so we would get a couple of deals in and we would do you know two five ten fifteen million um in, in consulting, right? But as you know the, the, these things are, are cyclical. You know there's something you do a big project take a year and a half and then the client will say. We need to take a breather for six months. Well, so, well, but the company wanted to look at, well, you did 15 million last year, so you need to do 20 million this, next year with that, with that client. It's like, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. We should, we should be thanking God that we did 15 million because nobody does 15 million with this company, right? But you don't just turn around and say, oh, well, it's 20 million, otherwise you're fired, right, next year. And it's, it's insane how we, how we reward good performance and, and actually what all we're doing is killing the golden goose yeah yeah i see that a lot in sales companies where the sales manager fire basically pushes out the door a top sales person because the sales per person is making three times or five times or ten times what the sales manager does and you know in the companies i've owned and this for our entrepreneurs listen i don't care if my salesperson makes three million bucks a year because i'm making six you know if it's yeah. my company Never, ever put a cap on a, in, a, in my opinion, on a salesperson's uh, uh, ability to, to get bonus and everything else in their salary. Uh, just make sure you're doing it right so that you've always got that margin of profit for your company. Sure. I'd love to have five salespeople uh, crushing it to where I would, they were all making millions of dollars because I'd be, you know, wiring it to them from my uh, house in the Cayman <laughs> Islands. <laughs> and, and, and don't take them out of the position that made them successful. Right, or the conditions. Like, so let, let's take your example. It was a beautiful example. Let's say someone wants to work two months a year, bang, hits the year's targets, and then go, go rest for 10 months. Why would we insist that they work four months a year? Oh, because that's going to double the productivity. No, it's not. It's probably going to kill the productivity because they've, they've got a scheme that works for them. Yeah. 
why would why would you ruin something that's working just because you don't think it's right that you have to work 12 months and this person only has to work to you give them a target they hit the target we're done yeah yeah and for that particular case you know you say we'll sell more no his contract was 12. they're not giving him anymore he doesn't want anymore you know i i can do all this in in 70 days and i can take the rest of the whole rest of the year off and i've made a huge chunk of everything i need to live on so this is all you know he also said this is as much as i want to do here's my boundary i will do 12 of these and they will all be world class and if i can do it in a week or it takes me six months whatever it takes i'll deliver exactly what i promised at the highest possible level of quality that can be achieved yeah. so it's, it's a good lesson for us of like you said activity versus outcomes yeah it's not running around in circles it's hey i delivered all this stuff and i only had to run around in one circle yeah, absolutely. So, John, that, that was such a pleasure. This has been so much fun. It's been so, so, um, so much learning as well. Thank you ever so much for for sharing your experience, your um, your stories, your your phrases, your, all all the good stuff. Um, I would absolutely encourage everyone to go visit um, the site and to go visit the the YouTube channel because it, I mean you, you've got literally everything you need to run your business there. Um, it's free of charge. Just just go watch it. Um, but for people to get in touch with you and, 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 and to work with you, what's the easiest way for people to get in touch with you? Well, I, it's pretty easy. My email is john at johnspence.com. And I answer all my, so if you've got a question or read it in Georgia, I didn't cover something or something was confusing, don't hesitate to send me a note and I'll do everything I can to answer it. And as I always like to say, if I don't have the answer, I can find somebody who does. Maybe I'll call George back and go, they got me here, man. I, but john at johnspence.com. And like, like George said, everything I've got, I put up as free on the YouTube and I've got a, a blog and a newsletter and all that stuff of only the best stuff I'm finding all free. So sign up for that stuff and get the free stuff. Great. And you know, th those of you who are watching, if you have questions, comments, if there's other stuff that we didn't cover that you would like us to cover, I, I, any excuse in the world to, to invite John back. So please send, send in your, um, your, your questions, send in your comments. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know if we're helping you and, and what we could do to help you more. Um, that's, what, that's why we do this. We do this to help as, you know, as many people as possible. So thank you ever so much, John. It was a real pleasure, and I can't wait to look forward to the next time. It's my honor. Thank you, George. Thank you so much. Thanks.